Thanks, Peter. That piece was entitled In His Love. It was a fairly recent composition, and it was played there by our young Brokhoven. He's a, a Dutchman, and he was the choir master of the choir that I sang in a couple of years ago. When the virus started, and in the Netherlands, where he lives, went into lockdown on the 12th of March. On the 13th of March, he produced his first online Facebook concert. He has an organ at home which he plays. On, and he, he was producing one concert per day for people to listen to. And it's amazing how many thousands of people listen to that. And I've been listening to quite a few of those and that came from one of those particular Facebook concerts. As you can see they were distancing and of course there was no other audience. But that particular piece and particularly with a pan flute, every time I listen to anything with a pan flute or that sort of piece of music it causes goosebumps up and down my spine so I wanted to share that particular one with you. I would like to just read the chorus of that particular song. His love is never far away, yet sometimes hard to see. If we would take the time to play, his love would flow through you and me. So for our opening or of our worship leading, I've decided to focus on love. Now I'd like to share with you a bit from Matthew 22. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. It is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So shall we pray? Our pray prayer of adoration. Thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to worship, for the freedom to be amongst your family, meeting together in your house, in the warmth of your loving embrace. Thank you that the presence we can put aside and the uncertainties of the world and rest upon the, the certainties of your kingdom with your promises which are unchangeable, immovable and eternal. Thank you that we can bring to your feet all the hurts and fears and troubles we have and leave them there knowing that in your strength and assurance and love is all that we require. Thank you that as we draw near in worship, we are transported from our world of concerns and fears to a place where we can be at peace in your presence, find healing, wholeness and refreshment. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to worship. Amen. And we can now have our, our first song. As I said, I've tried to incorporate love into most of them. And, uh, but if you could remain seated and maybe sing along with this first song, The Power of Your Love.
Thanks, Peter. I would not now like us to do a responsive reading of Psalm 136, verses 1 to 9, and then 24 to 26. And again, the theme is love. So if you could respond with the, the red words, which, just in case you can't read them, says, His love endures forever. <clears throat> Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods, for his love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords, for his love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, his love endures forever. Who spreads out the earth upon the waters, his love endures forever. Who made the great lights, his love endures forever. The sun to govern the day, his love endures forever. And the moon and stars to govern the night, his love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies, his love endures forever. He gives food to every creature, his love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven, his love endures forever. And if we could, again, if you would remain seated for this one, we would have our, our next song. What I've always been amazed at, one of the things I started doing during this COVID-19 is record songs of praise every Sunday on the ABC. Of course, it's a BBC production. And I thought, I find it absolutely amazing listening to it but then seeing the expression on the faces of the people in the congregation where they sing it. So what I've managed to do for this particular song, I did a, a cut and paste on a song of praise uh, using the same thing that I do for the online services. So this is, song is sung by the congregation of St. Paul de Leon in Penzance. And as I said, it's from Songs of Praise. So our second song, thanks Peter.
started playing a second time. There are other sort of Kremlins in the system at times. So thank you, Peter. And I know that was a short song. It was only just over two minutes. That's all right. I'll make up for it later on. Now, I do see there is one child here. Does he want to go out to uh, Kids Church? He doesn't? He's happy to stay here. Okay, that's thanks. Thanks, Kerry. <laughs> thanks for your preparation anyway, Kerry, that you did, <laughs> but not having to use it. It's ready for another time. Now, in lieu of notices, I just would like to remind you that uh, we don't have anyone going around with an, an offering bag, but there is a urn on the table at the back of the church, so uh, if you want to give your donation to the church as per usual, then of course you can just place it in the urn at the end of the service. Now our prayer for others. Is there anyone that you would like to pray for at this particular time? Kerry? Um, my niece Nicole and her new fiance Josh were engaged last night, so Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Two weeks ago. Okay. Yeah. COVID-19? Yes. Yes? Um, pray for um, the last mother named Brene, who's been battling addiction for the last 10 years, and she's been free since January. And um, mm -hmm. just pray for her to um, get back into the community and God will touch her life. Okay, so shall we pray? <laughs> our loving Father, <laughs> listen to our prayers. And listen to the people who've mentioned who they would like to pray for and especially we would consider at this particular time the people in Victoria where parts are actually devastated at the moment with the COVID-19 and not just those in Victoria but those all over the world the number of people seem to be increasing every day still but would help us in this particular time and help us to control this absolutely deadly virus which exists in the world. And Heavenly Father, we also thank you for the things that were mentioned, including the rain that has been so welcome, particularly in the farming communities. We also offer a prayer to the extended fam local family who lost a young son due to a tragic accident earlier this week. Send them your comfort, your love, your peace, and your calming presence to them. We pray for the lost, the hurting, the lonely, and those who are imprisoned behind both visible and invisible walls. We pray for those who struggle with mental illness, anxiety, and depression. We pray that there will be resources released to help enough staff employed and finances given towards mental health services nationally. Help us to be a friend and to offer a listening ear to those who suffer. Fill us with compassion and wisdom. We pray for those who carry heavy burdens that bend them low and limit their lives. And we are complicit in burdening others when we walk past people in need Lift our view to see with your compassionate eyes. 
unbend us, remove us from the rigidness and the restricts that impede us. Enable us all to embody the hope, the freedom that you offer, Lord. May our love for you help us to love and to forgive others and make a difference in this world. Lord, we have so many in need and we are not adequate to help them. Your name is powerful and your power is great. So in your name, we pray that we believe and help all those people in need. Amen. Well, we're going quite well for time, so I have included another song at this stage before I ask Jeff to come up. Again, it's one of the ones from Songs of Praise, so we're going to be short, and let's hope this time it doesn't start immediately replaying itself. So our next song, thanks. Peter. <laughs> particular one was a church in York by the way. I would like now to call up Jeff to give us our message this morning. Morning. Warm enough? Hopefully you won't go to sleep. No longer church on the couch. Church in the hall. And if we've not met, my name's Jeff. And if we have met, my name's Jeff. And if you've been following the online messages while the doors were shut, you would have seen we started a series called Finding Joy in the Jumble. It's based on the New Testament book of Philippians. We started looking in chapter 1 at how you can find joy through prayer. And then we looked at chapter 2 about finding joy through demonstrating our love to other people and last time in chapter 3 we talked about finding joy in one of the most dangerous ships in the world remember what that was anyone no it's a relation relationship yep so this morning I want to wrap up the series by looking at chapter 4 of the book of Philippians because I reckon this underlines and summarizes everything that Paul has been trying to say throughout the whole book if you ask any of my family my kids, 
my grandkids, what my favourite vegetable is. They would tell you straight away, what is it, Joy? Peas. Peas. Yeah. When our kids were very little, it was a family joke that whenever I cooked, no matter what we have, we always had peas on the plate. Now apparently my kids are so traumatised by this, they refuse to eat them again. I don't know, what's wrong with peas on your Weetabix? <laughs> so in 1969, John Lennon and Yoko Ono released a song, Give Peace a Chance. I of course changed the words and had my own song. And over the years, they gave me lots of related paraphernalia as presents, so I brought a couple along. So that hangs proudly in one of my rooms. It's a little kid's plate. It says, give peas a chance. So there you go, that's a, a precious gift. Then to my give peace a chance song, I added the only thing I ever needed in the world was peas, love and understanding. And I thought that was funny. However, in 1974, Nick Lowe wrote a song which he called What's So Funny About Peace, Love and Understanding. Apparently he didn't get my joke. But anyway, you may have heard Elvis Costello sing the song. And it's got interesting words and it was written 46 years ago. But it still speaks about the here and now. It still speaks about today. And here's how it starts. As I walk through this wicked world, searching for light in the darkness of insanity, I ask myself, is all hope lost? Is there only pain and hatred and misery? And each time I feel like this inside, there's one thing I wanna know. What's so funny about peace, love and understanding? What's so funny about peace, love and understanding? You feeling a bit like that this morning? Looking for a bit of peace, love and understanding. Unsure about all this COVID-19 news and where it's going. Confused about where life might be leading you. Maybe you lost your job. Or money's a bit tight. Or your relationship at home is not where you really want it to be. Or people are giving you a hard time that's something that's not necessarily your fault. You can't see too much hope for the future in all the mess around you. So much for peace, love and understanding. If that's you this morning, then there's some inspirational words coming your way from Philippians chapter 4. In fact, they're words to remind all of us that God not only hears our concerns and our prayers, but he also cares. Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. That includes your failures and your problems, your criticisms that you get, your future or your past, your job or your lack of your job. But in everything, by praise and petition, with thanks God giving, you present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. For most of us though, our hope of peace is based on our circumstances. If everything is going well, if everything is harmonious in our life, my income, my relationships, my health, if all of my life is firing on all cylinders, all at the same time, I can have peace and I can be content. But Paul says, no. He says, I've learned the secret of contentment. He said it supersedes the circumstantial, which is interesting considering he was in prison when he wrote that. So what is the secret? Well, unlike other secrets that are buried, this one's hidden, it's hidden in the text. Specific steps on the journey of life. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Peace. That's what I want, not peas. I'm so stressed out about what the future's holding for me. If 
for this church, this congregation, for the world itself. Peace, it says. Peace that surpasses, transcends, goes beyond all our understanding. Peace that will guard our hearts and our minds. You want to find joy and contentment? What are the steps to peace, love and understanding? Well, the first step is found in verses 4 to 5. Realise that God is near. You know, there's a lot of comfort in knowing that God is not distant. He's close by. Moses was a big follower of God. And God had called him to lead his people, Israel, out of slavery and into the promised land. By the time you get to chapter 33 of the book of Exodus in the Old Testament, God had led all the Israelites out of Egypt through a series of miracles. He'd split the Red Sea. The entire nation had walked through on dry ground and escaped the Egyptian army. You would think then that they would be the most grateful, most obedient, most trusting group of people to ever walk the face of the earth. Instead, Moses got a crash course in humanity and he discovers that instead, these Israelites are stubborn. They're stiff-necked. They are ungrateful grumblers. And Moses has got a heart-to-heart -heart chat with God coming up about the whole deal. He has no doubt about the greatness of God, but Moses needs assurance that God isn't going to desert him in the desert. He needs assurance that God is staying close by. In verse 12, Exodus 33, One day Moses said to the Lord, You've been telling me, take these people up to the promised land, but you haven't told me whom you will send with me. You've told me, I know you by name, and I look favourably on you. If it is true that you look favourably on me, let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favour. And remember that this nation is your very own people. You can kind of sense Moses' exasperation with the situation God had placed him in. He's actually saying, hey God, this was your idea. You were the one who called me to do this stuff. You ever felt like God asked you to do something? And you did. And then you saw things falling apart. So you act with all belief in your heart that you're doing the right thing. Only to discover down the road that it seems God has kind of shortchanged you. That God has asked you to jump into the deep end. And then only after you jump do you find that the pool's almost empty. That landing's going to hurt. Or maybe it's a relationship you're involved in that ended badly. Or you left your work for a new job only to be laid off shortly later. Or perhaps it's that God instructed you to take a risk personally, but it's been uphill all the way. Maybe some of that was how Moses was feeling. So how does God respond to this discouraged Moses? He said in verse 14 of Exodus 33, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. Now, I know this is God talking to Moses, but you do know that this applies to you today as well. Everything will be fine for you who follow the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the creator of the things in this world. And God responds to Moses by reassuring him, I personally will go with you. I personally will be with you. You might feel all tied up in knots about whatever it is that's troubling you, but God says, I am able to give you rest. I can make you lay down in green pastures. I will restore your soul. God reminds Moses of his presence, his closeness, his nearness, and everything will be okay. Step two. Substitute worry, put it on the sideline. You ever played a team sport and you weren't playing well? And the coach took you off because you were playing badly? You see it in team sports. 
But sometimes, though, it's not because of lack of effort. Sometimes it's a strategic move. Like in rugby, where the front row forwards, if you've ever watched the game, they're really big guys. And they're pushing and tackling and running and crashing each, uh, into each other. And about 60 minutes in the game, that's about three quarters of the way through, the front row gets replaced by three other guys who are just as big, just as tough, just as fast, but they've got fresher legs and more stamina. So these others are often referred to as specialists because they come on a specific time to do a special job. It's always for the betterment of the team. Replacement and substitution is a major part of sports life. And Paul says in these verses, he's telling us that we should also make the right type of substitution in our own life. Things that are dragging us down, performing badly, get them off. Put them on the sidelines. Worry doesn't deserve a place in your team or in your life. So put it on the bench, he says. Don't let it affect you. Substitute it. And step three, replace it. Two for one. Well, you can't get an extra player in a game, but this is your life, and you can do what you like. You can substitute two for one, or as Joy would say, buy one, get one free. <laughs> Talking of free, I heard the Bunnings were giving away batteries the other day. It turned out they really were free of charge. <laughs> boom, boom. The first substitute for worry is prayer. Be anxious for nothing. So start to pray and invite God into your self-talk. Include God in the conversations. Someone once said, worry is a conversation that you have with yourself about things that you cannot change. Where prayer is a conversation that you have with God about things that he can change. So you put worry on the side and you put prayer on in its place. But not only that, as verse 6 says, you bring on the second substitute, the free one, thanksgiving. You think about the good things in your life. You remember the good people in your life. You remember God's goodness in your life. Thanksgiving is just remembering all the positive things in your life. You know, we never seem to have trouble remembering all the bad things about our lives, all the negative things that have happened to us. They often just drop into our thoughts without us having to even think about remembering them. They occur easy enough, however we deliberately have to work hard at trying to replace them with positive thoughts. The Old Testament book of Lamentations shows us that we can be honest with God. It teaches us that faith is not about spiritual denial. If we're hurt or confused or angry, we can tell God. And he's not offended by it. He's a very secure God. The author of the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah, was a prophet. He'd gone around warning the people of Israel to repent of their wicked ways. Or, he said, they would suffer. Now, God wouldn't punish them directly, but he would remove his hand of protection and life itself would punish these people. They would suffer the consequences of their idolatry and their godless behaviour. And then in 586 BC, the Babylonians invaded. They broke down the walls of Jerusalem, destroyed the temple that Solomon had built, ransacked the place and took much of the population back into captivity for another 70 years. Jeremiah and some others were left behind and he remembered how difficult things were and he wrote this in Lamentations 3. I'll never forget the trouble, the utter lostness, the taste of ashes, the poison I've swallowed. I remember it all, oh how well I remember the feeling of hitting the bottom. You ever hit the bottom? Felt utterly lost without an answer? Jeremiah had too. But he also said, but there's one thing I remember and remembering, I keep a grip on hope. What's 
the product of the church? Well, the product of McDonald, the thing it's known for is fast food. The product of Nike, the thing it's known for is sportswear. The product of the church, the thing we dispense, the thing we have, the thing we should be known for is hope. No other company or organisation or business outlet, whatever, dispenses hope. Ours is authentic, God-based hope. And Jeremiah goes on to say, God's loyal love couldn't have run out. His merciful love couldn't have dried up. They're created new every morning. How great is your faithfulness. I'm sticking with God. I say it over and over, even if he's all I've got left. Sometimes you'll find in life that if God is all you've got left, then God is all you need. I'm going to choose to remember God and be thankful. Because whatever your trial, God sees it. Whatever your struggles, God knows about it. Whatever your cry, God hears it. Whatever your difficulty, God cares about it. Whatever your problems, God understands. There's no perfect life. There's no perfect job. There's no perfect childhood. No perfect marriage. No perfect congregation. And no perfect set of people who will always do what we expect them to do. What we do have though is a perfect God who's able to lead us through an imperfect life with unfailing strength, impeccable wisdom and infinite love. And we should remember that with thanksgiving. The first step is to realise God is near. Secondly, put worry on the substitute's bench. And thirdly, bring on the two replacements of prayer and thanksgiving. That leads us to the last step. Philippians 4, 7, 8 says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honourable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. Step four, guard your thought life. Or in other words, we should think about what we think about. Romans 12 reminds us that we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. Sure, our hearts are changed, but our minds are the gateway to the heart. And we need to guard it properly. We need to protect it. If we ever ride a bike, we wear a crash helmet. When we get in the car, we wear a seatbelt. And during the quarantine, we close things down. Shops, factories, sports, mixing with people. Why do we do that? For protection, to guard against getting the virus. That's how serious we take protection and guarding things that are really important, like people are and just how important are our minds. So how do we guard our minds? Well, not like a lifeguard. When you go to the beach and you're playing in the water and you're swimming and you're surfing or you're kayaking, you don't need a lifeguard. But when you get into trouble or difficulty, then the lifeguard comes in handy. So this lifeguard doesn't turn up before you get into trouble, but you definitely need them after you get in trouble. So this guarding that they're talking about here is not like a lifeguard, but it's more like a security guard because they stop you getting into the predicament in the first place. They're there to prevent the problem. So to guard your mind means to put a security guard at the doorway of your mind, preferably someone built like a bouncer. Nightclubs and the like don't want undesirables getting in. People who try and cause trouble that's why they've got trained security guards to stop potential problems. And Paul says the same thing here. Guard your minds. Keep the security guard bouncer right there so that the undesirable thoughts don't get in and cause you trouble and stop you keep on remembering the good stuff. 
I'm sure you've already noticed, but in verse 7 it says the peace of God. And then in verse 9 it says the God of peace. That's not an error. It's not a misprint. It's saying two different things. On the one hand, we have the peace of God. In other words, the promise of God. And on the other hand, we have the God of peace, the person, God himself. So as we try to answer the question from the song, as I walk through this wicked world, searching for light in the darkness of insanity, I ask myself, is all hope lost? Is there only pain and hatred and misery? No. All hope is not lost. And no, there isn't just pain and hatred and misery. Because as we walk through this wicked world looking for joy in the jumble, searching for light in the darkness, we have on the one side of us the promise of God. And on the other side of us, we have the presence of God. Both providing protection as we take the steps of life, realising that God is near. Substituting worry and replacing it with prayer and thanksgiving. And all the time guarding our thought life. Then we will find that not only is there hope, but thanks to God, there is also peace, and there is love, and there is understanding. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word that encourages and teaches us about your great love for us. May we remember those words during this week as we come across different struggles and issues that face our life, as we're challenged in different situations. Lord, be very near to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to close with our final song. Thank you, Peter.
pray. Father, we don't have to see you to believe that our help comes from you. As we go out from here this morning, Lord, be with us again. Sustain us, encourage us. Bless us as we talk to others and share our faith. Help us in our belief, Lord. Help us to find peace, love and understanding. We ask that in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.